Welcome to the Early Edge College Football Pick Show brought to you by BetMGM, the sports book born in Vegas. I'm your host, Eric Cohen, and while it's far from the most exciting college football slate that we have in week six, there's still plenty of money-making opportunities, and we'll help you find them. But it is time to bring in the best college football experts that I know. We have the super savvy capper, M squared, Mike McClure. We have the master of the upset, and yes, he did it again last week, Emery Hunt. And from the Cover 3 podcast, see, I got it right this week, it's Chip Patterson. Gentlemen, we'll start it off. I mean, last week, Alabama, Georgia, all of you hit your bets. And I, well, I don't want to talk about Georgia. I, I felt like, yeah, towards the end of the game. So let's talk about the SEC. After Georgia's loss to Bama, who is your pick to win the conference? Mike, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm going to be on Bama here, EC. You know, I look, I think Georgia is still right there with them in terms of those two teams being very, very good and very close. I just don't think Georgia is going to be able to reach the title game because of the schedule that they've got coming up. So I, I personally like Bama here. Uh, and, and when I look at Texas, I think Texas has the more difficult road. I think they're the better team. But considering the quarterback uh, situation there, we'll see when Quinn Ewers is able to return. For me right now, it's got to be the favorite with Bama. As I think their schedule sets up very friendly their real big tough game that they had on the schedule this year not that there aren't other tough games but the one that they were probably going to lose was that georgia game the fact that they were able to get it love their odds of just simply being in that title game now i mean just to echo kirby smart here what do you think you're gonna do what can you do to stop alabama's offense when you've got a player like jalen milrow who has so many different ways to beat you you know, the only thing you do traditionally is you try to bring in extra bodies, try to bring them close to the line of scrimmage. You try to take away from the pass defense. Well, 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 well what are you going to do with Ryan Williams out there on one side? What are you going to do with Jeremy Bernard? What are you going to do with Kendrick Law? That, I understand that other offenses have put up better statistics in terms of yards or points, but if we want to talk about actually game planning and scheming to try to stop a team that wants to get in the end zone, no one has more punches and counter punches than the Alabama Crimson Tide. Oh yeah, the offensive line's good and they got two good running backs. So impressed with Alabama. I think they'll be able to navigate the rest of the way. And look, the remaining schedule, as Mike said, is going to set them up to be in Atlanta. I'll take it one further. I've got a lot of confidence that they win in Atlanta, even if it's a rematch against the Bulldogs. What you expect shouldn't surprise you. I expected Bama to beat Georgia, and I expect Texas to win the SEC. So I'm not going to move off that pick based on what I saw Bama do with Georgia. I expected that, so it didn't surprise me. I like Texas. I like how they're built on both sides of the line of scrimmage. I trust Quinn Ewers more than I trust Carson Beck. And I do feel like Bama will make this one a game. And oh, by the way, this little important tidbit, we saw Texas beat Alabama last year uh, in Tuscaloosa. So I, I've seen them do it before. I know they're well built on both sides of the line of scrimmage, which is important, versus Bama. They have tremendous talent at wide receiver, which can attack this Bama secondary, like Chip brought up all last week's episode, which was true in that ball game against Georgia. So even if you get a Quinn Ewers out there or from what we've seen so far from an Arch Manning, now Manning brings in the athletic aspect of it more so than yours. I still like Texas's chances to knock off Bama. Guys, Georgia's still plus 550. That's great value. If they make it back, rematch against Bama, I like their chances. Just, just saying. All right. Let's talk about the Big 12, my favorite conference to discuss this year, as probably is true with M squared. So there are four teams per BetMGM's odds within five to one to win the conference. Kansas State's four to one, Iowa State's four to one, Utah is four and a half to one, and my Arizona Wildcats, after that top 10 upset on the road, are five to one. All right, Chip, we're going to start with you. You're going a little bit different than the rest of us. What do you got? Yeah, I, I think that Iowa State is um, is for real. Uh, I think that this is a team that does a great job of playing defense. They've been running the football well effectively the last couple times out. But most importantly, Iowa State schedule sets up that they are going to be favored in basically every single game until the end of the season. They get Kansas State at home. They do have to play Utah. But, I mean, who knows where Utah is going to be at that point in the season, given the ups and downs, given the availability, unavailability of Adam Driver. I mean, Cam Rising. Sorry about that, guys. We all know Cam Rising's not available. That's Adam Driver. He's doing a character study. So <clears throat> Iowa State does not make mistakes. Iowa State does not beat themselves. Uh, I think the Cyclones are in a great position here for Matt Campbell to lead them into Big 12 title contention. So, yeah, I'll take a flyer on the Cyclones at this price to be able to win it. 
All right, M squared. I mean, do I even need to tee this up? We know where you're going. Going to Kansas State here. They look great. Bounce back in a big way against Oklahoma State. Uh, the game that I'm worried about for them is the next game on the schedule, and that's Colorado, just because of the athleticism that Colorado possesses. Uh, I love the fact that Kansas State gets the bye week ahead of that to prepare. Uh, so I'm going to be on them here just because after this Colorado game, it's pretty much smooth sailing until the final week of the year on the road at Iowa State. And I ultimately think that game right there will determine who goes to the Big 12 title game. Uh, when you talk about about Iowa State, I agree with Chip in Iowa State being a team that no one wants to face. I love that Kansas State gets them last. I think the tough part for Iowa State is going to be that back-to-back -back week. You've got Utah, November 23rd, Kansas State, November 30th. In between there, the Thanksgiving holiday, all the travel, all the distractions. That's going to be a tough stretch for Iowa State to go 2-0, in my opinion. Uh, I like Kansas State here still because I, I think that they had one bad week, one weird game in Provo. Uh, other than that, I think it's all systems go for Avery Johnson. Emery, I know you love yourself some Colorado, but you're going with uh, this this team right here, huh? <clears throat> well, when you think about Arizona, and yes, you can talk about Colorado, you can talk about BYU, who sits atop the Big 12 right now, uh, but when you look at Arizona specifically, I, I find them to be fascinating because you have a legit top 15 pick at, at wide receiver in McMillan, you have a quarterback that I think would be a star in the CFL based on how wide the field is and how he plays the game. And you have a secondary that has like three Metroid-like defensive backs back there. They're long, they're athletic, they can make plays on the ball. This is a very good football team on both sides that can create a lot of problems for a lot of teams. And because they play offense the way they do, it gives you a puncher's chance in any ball game they face. And because they have those guys on the back end in the secondary, it gives you a chance to steal a possession away. So I like Arizona's shot to, to win the Big 12 as well. Boy, Emory, you just made my day. With that said, Utah, schedule still sets up well. And if Cam Rising is healthy, as Chip alluded to, I still I still would pick the Utes. All right, let's talk about fishy lines. Uh, it's not the, not the greatest slate of college football. Next week and the following week are all-timers, in my opinion. Mike, what's your fishiest line this week? Uh, I mean, I think it's got to be Michigan-Washington here. I, I know that it's a revenge game for Washington. The team's just drastically different, and, and the market's just far too low on Michigan. You know, we watched what Michigan was able to do to USC. They're going to be able to do the same thing in this one. It's going to be an ugly game where they have a lot of time of possession. You've got Alex Orgy, who is legit NFL running back being able to play quarterback. It's like what we've watched Taysom Hill do at times. That's what's going to happen here. He is so hard to bring down. They're going to be able to continue to move the chains because he's just so big and such an elite athlete. I don't think that Washington is good enough in this spot to be favored. I know it's a home game, uh, but I am not impressed with this Washington team at all. Meanwhile, Michigan has proven that they've still got it in the trenches where it matters most, and, and that's the difference in this game to me. So I think this line is a little fishy here with Washington still being a favorite. I totally agree with you, Mike. And my main reasoning is because of Michigan's defense versus Washington's quarterback and passing game. That's going to be a non-starter for me. Unless you're able to play above the X's and O's, supersede pressure, and make tight window throws under the rest, I can't trust you versus a defense like Michigan. And that's why I can't trust Washington in this spot versus the Wolverines. I just think their defense will be the main reason why they're able to slowly uh, salt this game away on the other side of the ball. So <clears throat> I'm going to take you to Thursday night, El Paso, a little Cayusa action on CBS Sports Network, a.k.a. the mothership, this here fine network. Because Sam Houston's on a little bit of a roll, and not a lot of people are talking about KC Keeler's group. But right now, they're sitting there 4-1. and one. The only loss was to UCF. They beat up on Hawaii. Uh, New Mexico State took care of business and then had a second-half comeback against Texas State in NRG Stadium over the weekend. Now, you might be thinking there's a letdown, but not me. I think this is really fishy. I think this 10-point spread should be like 17. What has UTEP done to lead you to believe that they're going to be able to stand in the way of an absolute locomotive in Conference USA? It's fishy, fishy. But I agree with you on Michigan, Washington. Y'all just took all that. And uh, I don't think Washington, which replaced every starter off a of Joe Moore Award winner, is going to be able to block the combination of Kenneth Grant and Mason Graham. But, but keep your eyes on that Thursday night game in Conference USA. 
Boy, Chip, you're really going off the grid here. That's Emory style right there. Listen, I agree with you guys on Michigan, Washington, but how about Tennessee favored by less than two touchdowns against Arkansas? Does somebody know something? We'll find out later in the show. All right. So for the best plan that you can get to sportsline.com, use promo code winners for 60% off an annual plan. You won't find a better deal anywhere on the site. That's promo code winners. Join Sportsline for best bets, model picks, picks from these guys, and much more. Coming up next. Can Ohio State continue their early season dominance, this time against one of the nation's top defenses in Iowa? We'll make our week six selections here on the Early Edge College Football Pick Show. Welcome back to the Early Edge, and it's the only ranked versus ranked matchup on the week six slate. Ouch. Number nine, Missouri at number 25, Texas A&M is the wrong team favored. Emery, we'll start with you. Yes, because when you look at Missouri, we talked about Arizona earlier in the show, uh, how they have an NFL top 15 pick at receiver. I mean, you arguably have the best receiver in the country that's draft eligible in Luther uh, Burton. So for me, Yes, they are. And I could trust Missouri's quarterback a lot more than the AM situation and just overall team. I feel like Missouri gets underrated. I'm a big Brady Cook guy coming into the season. He was my fifth best quarterback in the country uh, outside of Shadur Sanders, Cam Ward, Jalen Miro, Caden Salter, and Brady Cook was sitting right there at number five because I like how he plays the game. He reminds me a lot of what Andy Dalton was doing at TCU. I just feel like Missouri is in a prime spot sitting there at big number nine. They'll take care of business on the road against the Aggies. Yeah, I'm going to be taking Missouri as well. Uh, the thing that stands out to me when I look at the Tigers is the fact that they have not thrown their fastball yet. They have not played their best game. And I wonder if sometimes getting uncomfortable is what a college football team needs because for Missouri, it's been a home stand against opponents that they are favored to beat. Sometimes, like against Vanderbilt, sometimes, like against Boston College, it's much closer than you might have expected. So now we get to see Missouri go on the road. So let's flip through the book, okay? Let's go back to when Missouri went on the road last year. They only did it four times, but what happened to each of those four times? They covered the spread. 4-0 against the spread in true road games last year. That includes a win against Kentucky when they were a small underdog, which, check, small underdog. It also included a pretty impressive performance against Georgia in Athens. I think this is a group that probably just needed to get out of Columbia, and they know looking at the schedule that if you're going to have the juices flowing for the game's a real consequence in November, you got to find your best form here in October. I'm expecting Missouri's best game of the season. I'm expecting another Missouri road win. I'm going to be on the other side here, but it is not a strong play by any means. I would be playing Missouri if you were giving me four points in this one. Uh, it, it is their first true road game. It's their first road game, but definitely a first real road game in conference. Uh, and I think that's significant because this is one of the best home field advantages in college football. Now, Missouri does catch a break with this an 11 a.m. kickoff, not a night game at Kyle Field. But I've been a little unimpressed with Missouri in terms of their discipline. They've been penalized a lot in certain situations, especially especially in that Boston College game. Uh, and I think that could come back to bite them with an early start on the road in this particular spot. As long as Marcel Reed is the quarterback, I love the dual threat ability that he has. I think he was a massive upgrade over Connor Wegman. So I like AM here to simply win the game. Uh, you see this number at two and a half. It, it makes sense to me why it is where it is. I'm still very, very high on Missouri, and I think they're a great football team. I just think this could be the wrong spot on the road at AM. Guys, I flip-flopped on my pick uh, like three times this week. I started with a and I'm back to Missouri. But, it, I, I mean, it's just – it's tough. I don't trust the A&M offense. Missouri ha gives up the third fewest yards per game, 219, and only 12 points per game. Meanwhile, A&M has held four straight opponents to 20 points or fewer. That means we're going to have an underline. Missouri also 7-1 and one against the spread in their last eight on the road to back up Emory and Chips Point. And we saw that graphic, A&M not so good against ranked opponents – very close, low scoring, this under 48 and a half. I don't think it's in jeopardy all game. Missouri 20, Texas A&M 19. All right, 3.30 p.m. Eastern on Saturday on CBS. We have the Iowa Hawkeyes at the number three Ohio State Buckeyes. Ohio State's only giving 19 and a half. But Chip, you're going to start us off with a total. An, yeah. an over? 
Hey, buddy, are you, are you stuck in 2023? All right. Iowa overs have been an ATM. Iowa overs are 4-0 and on the season. Now, there's two reasons for that. Yes, Caleb Johnson has become one of the most dynamic running backs in the Big Ten, and I do think new offensive coordinator Tim Lester is doing a good job of keeping defenses off balance, but they don't have a downfield passing attack. They still are just finding more creative ways to run, but they are finding more ways to score points. But... We have also seen this Iowa defense give up big plays in a way that we haven't before. So the Iowa over situation has great explanation on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball about how this is not your grandfather's Iowa Hawkeyes. Now let's think about how that applies to Ohio State. So if the defense is giving up explosive plays, does Ohio State have players who can take advantage of explosive plays? That answer would be a resounding heck yes. Now, for the other side, we have seen, you know, Marshall got a touchdown on their very first drive. You know, we have gotten like one good Michigan State drive, a lot of turnovers in between. I think Iowa can get us to 14, or at least in that 13, 14, 17 range. And then I'm counting on the Buckeyes big plays to take us the rest of the way. Line too little on the total. I'm going Ohio State, Iowa over. All right, you sold me on that one, Chip. All right, M-squared, we talked about fishiest lines early in the show. This one does not seem fishy. This one seems fairly easy, right? I think it does. I like uh, uh, Ohio State here in minus 19 and a half. I think it should be on the other side of 21. I think it should be between 21 and a half, 23 and a half. Uh, and it wouldn't shock me if they essentially approach that total on their own. Uh, so I do like their team total over 33 and a half as well. Uh, and the thing is, is Ohio State, we know they're going to have big plays down the field that we, I don't think I was going to be able to keep up here. Uh, so I love Ohio State. I think there's a good chance they go up 21, nothing in this game and, and really parlay that into a nice cover the rest of the way. So I think this is a big spot where Ohio State reminds us uh, that they're really one of the best teams in college football now that they're playing some of the better opponents on the schedule here. Uh, I think this is an absolute blowout of a game. I agree with you, Mike. This game could be 19 and a half to nothing. Ohio State wins, right? So I like Ohio State to cover these points. Uh, they're explosive at every skill position multiple times over and on defense they can get after the quarterback they can chase the run going outside and they have dudes on the back end that's going to play on sundays that could take the ball away so iowa will have to play his best game offensively consistently for 60 minutes i just don't see that happening so i do love ohio state here minus a 19 and a half did, did you guys see that graphic that was just up there this is the fourth time in history that a big 10 team has won their first games by the first four games by 30 plus I, you think I was going to stay within 20 of this team? No, no way. I will 6 and one against the spread in their past seven against ranked teams. And their average, they're, they're losing by an average of 27 points per game. I think Ohio State puts it on them this week. Buckeyes 40, Hawkeyes 10. Yeah, it keeps that 30 point streak going. All right. Uh, we're not done with the, the week six top matchups. Uh, the defending national champs are underdogs. We talked about it earlier against the team they beat last season in the championship game. Do the odds makers have it right? Find out next on the Early Edge. Back on the Early Edge, and as I discussed earlier, I, this one kind of feels like a fishy line to me. Number four, te Tennessee heads to Fayetteville to take on Arkansas, and they're only given 13 and a half points. But let's start here with the master of the first quarter line, and that's what his new nickname will be in my book, M Squared. Start us off. I'm looking at Tennessee in the first quarter here. Uh, you see, you know, when you look at this game, do you think Tennessee is going to score a touchdown in the first quarter? I do. They continue to score touchdowns in first quarters like crazy, averaging 18 points in the first quarter. I know the competition level has varied, but let's not say that Tennessee's just played only cupcake teams. They've already played uh, NC State. They've already played Oklahoma. I personally don't think Arkansas gets in the end zone in the first quarter here. I love this number at three and a half for Tennessee. I think they're going to be up at least a touchdown at the end of the first quarter here. I know it's a road game. I know it's at night. I know it's an SEC opponent. No one in this area, you know, non-Georgia, non-Alabama, non-Texas, nobody is there on Tennessee's level. So give me Tennessee in the first quarter, minus three and a half. 
Let the children sing! Yeah! All right. So, look, Mike is dialed on the first quarter plays across the country. Tennessee has been giving us this first quarter wins basically since Josh Heupel took over. The man comes in with a terrific game plan in terms of X's and O's. He does a fantastic job of preparing his team both sides of the ball mentally for what you need to do to come out and throw punches. And then let's throw in maybe what led you to saying this is fishy, EC, because I think that we can take some lessons from the Oklahoma game where Tennessee called off the dogs a little bit to let the defense go win the football game in the second half. What happened? Oklahoma made a quarterback change. They started moving the football. The Taylor Green for Arkansas is a dynamic quarterback. Uh, I am going to the first quarter not just because it is a really smart play and not just because Tennessee in the first quarter has been excellent, but also to be able to prevent from having to watch if Taylor Green does end up kicking in that back door so yeah uh, mike I'm, I'm right there with you i'm riding the train again choo choo tennessee first quarter i was this was a few weeks ago when arkansas played auburn i was texting back and forth with a college teammate of mine and he was watching the auburn arkansas game he, and he texted me he was like bro what you think arkansas sunday gonna look like now full explanation sunday is when the coaches run through what you did wrong in the game how many busts how many mistakes and you're running gassers, right? And I was like, man, they're gonna they're gonna be so tired on Sunday because Arkansas is one of the more undisciplined football teams you could watch. And they do have two elite talents in terms of guys that I like for the NFL draft. One you talked about uh their pass rusher, he's outstanding, but also Jaquindon Jackson, the running back, reminds me a lot of Matt Forte. But Taylor Green is super athletic, reminds me a lot of uh Randall Cunningham. But man, this Arkansas football team is so doggone undisciplined. And Funny enough, in order to be in the game against Tennessee, and people think this is the only terms when you're talking about triple option football, but you better be disciplined in your assignments, in your alignments, in your coverage. Expecting Arkansas to be disciplined for 60 minutes? No way. Ladies, 13 and a half points with Tennessee comfortably. Tennessee will blow the doors off the Razorbacks. Emory, I hate to be on the other side of you. I just It's never a good feeling. But Tennessee kind of feels like a team that's due for regression, especially their defense. They're giving up only 176 yards per game, which is best in the nation. But they haven't faced an offense as dynamic as Arkansas, who, by the way, is 13th in the country in yards per game with almost uh, 500 There is what they're averaging. Uh, just something about this Saturday night game in Fayetteville just seems weird to me. Watch, Look for Arkansas's defense to uh, rush defense, only giving up 93 yards per game. Can they slow Dylan Sampson and put it on Nico? I'm going to try his last name on the show uh, to to throw all that. I just think this is going to be a game in the going to be a close one in the fourth quarter. Tennessee 30, Arkansas 24. I think we cover. If we get a backdoor cover, great. But I'll take it. All right. So here's the last game of the week. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the, the uh, number 10 Michigan at Washington. These two teams faced off in the national championship game last year. I hate to say it, but I'm on the opposite side of all of you guys. I guess Emery, we'll we'll start with you on this one. I'm gonna help you out, EC is Iamaliava, because you're gonna hear that name Thank you. Yes. quite often against Arkansas because they're gonna score a bunch of points. As you will hear Orgy a lot on this broadcast, because again, Washington's offense is the problem here, in my opinion. Um, and they're going up against a defensive line that is gonna own the line of scrimmage, reset the line of scrimmage and camp out in the backfield of the Washington Huskies. I just don't see how Washington can win the point of attack consistently against Michigan. They couldn't do it against Washington State. They won't do it against the Wolverines. So trust Michigan here. Take them in the points. You can even take them on the money line. Michigan wins big out there on the West Coast. Right there with you, Emory. Michigan wins this game. They've got a distinct edge, in my opinion, on both lines of scrimmage. And I know you're going to hear about the revenge angle for the national title game. Two drastically different teams at this point. And Michigan, I think their defense is great. I think they're going to get after the quarterback here. And I think it's going to be uphill battle for Washington this entire way. And then once Michigan has a lead, even if it's a four-point lead, they're going to essentially play keep away. They're going to dominate time of possession in this game. We've already seen Michigan against opponents like this in USC, where when they know the run is coming, they still won't be able to stop it. Michigan's going to be able to pick up that key third down conversion time and time again in this game, and they're going to win the game. 
U N I T Y. U N I T Y. That's one, two, three. Bang! Let's go, Big Blue. All right, Michigan's going to win this football game because, as has been mentioned here, uh, Washington ain't going to be able to block Michigan. They haven't had to block anybody that's got the kind of defensive front like Michigan. It's going to go very, very poorly. Number two, this Washington team cobbled together with duct tape and the transfer portal is so undisciplined. You want to talk about teams that shoot themselves in the foot and are one of the worst in the country at finishing drives? Yeah, that would be the Washington Huskies. And Speaking of a category where you rank near the bottom of all 134 FBS teams, how about EPA from special teams? Number 128 because it's just miss, 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 miss. So this is already a team that can't punch it in the end zone because of their mistakes. And they've got problems kicking field goals. Now in a low scoring game where you got to be good at the details, how in the world is that going to help you against Michigan? EC, I anxiously await your rebuttal. All right, Chip. I'm saving the graphic here. Jed Fish needs this game. The Huskies are three and two. They probably should be five and zero, oh, and they're facing a team with a bottom five passing game in college football. Washington's defense has only given up 17 total points in three games at home. They are tenth in yards per game, surrendering approximately 250. And you know who coordinates that defense? Steve Belichick. His dad knows a thing or two about good defenses. I know we're taking out the historical trends from this game. I, I think you guys mentioned that. National championship game, throw it out. I mean, Washington has like two players left. Michigan probably has like five. Here's the reason I'm picking Washington here. They're going to be underdogs in five of their last six games. Look at that schedule. If they're going to make a bowl game, they need this game. They desperately need this game. Give me Washington 23, Michigan 16. I hope I'm, you know, I mean, I want to save the graphic here. I mean, I'm not rooting for Washington. I just want to say that. But I'm rooting for my pick to be true. All right, Chip, uh, do do you have some kind of, uh, bump that. Yeah, there you go. Let's let's hear it. Fight, 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 fight. It's kind of how I feel going against the three of you. Never, never a good feeling. I mean, listen, if you want to go against me on this one, I don't blame you for um, for tailing our experts. That's why they're so smart. All right, we've gone through the top games, but now it is time to see our week six best bets. Find out next. It is time for our best bets here on the Early Edge. Let's check out the recap screen. All right, so Emery with two sweat-free picks. He is now seven and three in this segment. I went one and one. The rest of the guys went one and one. Can anyone sweep the board this week? Emery, you are absolutely on fire, not only in this segment, but in, in our dog of the week where you're picking upsets left and right. Give us your first selection for week six. I mean, I, I wanted to make this fair for you guys, so that's why I didn't choose Army or Navy, so I left those guys alone. So I went to Indiana, the Hoosiers. They haven't been excited about the Hoosiers since Alex, uh, you know, the, the, since Thompson was out there running the football and Alex Smith was running the football. Um, those are two outstanding IU running backs. Go look those guys up. Anthony Thompson was the Heisman finalist. Alex Smith used to tote that rock for him in the late 90s. So just show you the football depth that I have here. But I'm saying all that to say, this is a track meet. North Northwestern doesn't have the speed, nor the amount of athletes that Indiana has at receiver, at running back, and the number one CFL draft prospect at quarterback and Curtis Rourke under center. Lay these 13 and a half points with the Hoosiers. They will blow the doors off of Northwestern. Well, you're talking CFL draft prospects. You're way over my head. No wonder you're such a genius at this, Emory. All right, Chip, All right, wait a second. USC is at Minnesota. USC has to travel east of the Mississippi again. The last time they did that a few weeks ago didn't go so well for them. Where do you stand this week? Uh, See, EC, sometimes it's physics, right? Sometimes it's about mass and velocity and heights and weights and speeds. And if you don't watch and if you just look at the numbers, you would say Minnesota's pass defense is great. Their run defense, I will admit, is pretty good. But you're like, wow, look at these pass defense numbers. To which I would say, now, now what are those dynamic passing attacks that Minnesota has played in order to get this robust collection of impressive pass defense statistics? Because here's the numbers that matter to me. Six feet, 180. 5'10", 190. 
six two two ten. Oh, what are you gonna do when six six two hundred and twenty pound Deuce Robinson is just making you too small in the end zone? Because what I saw in that Wisconsin game is the Badgers blew a halftime lead against the Trojans was a USC team that has a physical advantage against so many of the secondaries that they are going to face in the Big Ten. And I understand it's not the best thing to do against Michigan to throw the ball 40 some odd times per game. But I'm telling you that in this kind of matchup against those mid to bottom level Big Ten teams, those teams do not have the athletes to deal with one on one matchups and Lincoln Riley will do a good job of scheming up those one-on-one matchups. So I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I just don't think that over the course of 60 minutes, Minnesota is going to be able to defend the size and athleticism advantage that USC has at wide receiver. So Trojans, lay them. With that said, Chip, I just want to point out that Minnesota did kind of get a, a raw deal with that onside kick at Michigan last week. Minnesota, how will they respond to that? Just throwing it out there. All right, M squared, Ole Miss. Uh, inexcusable last week how do you lose at home to kentucky there's no way to justify it do they bounce back this week they bounce back in a big way uh look i was at that game in ole miss and oxford and it was frustrating to watch they they should have won the game they played not to lose rather than play to win it was very uncharacteristic really of lane kiffin i expect a way more aggressive approach in this one i like a minus four and a half in the first half of this game they've always started well in first quarters i think it continues throughout the first half you look at that kentucky game they fumbled the opening kickoff reviewed they got the ball marched down the field scored a touchdown touchdown the first two minutes of the game and you thought it was going to be a normal Ole Miss game where they come out and just awesome offensively that wasn't the case there a little lack of focus a little interesting game plan and frankly Kentucky very good team defensively up front we've seen them play tight against Georgia Uh, I like the spot for Jackson Dart in this Ole Miss offense though I'm going to lay the four and a half in the first half I think they respond in a big big way have a touchdown lead at least going into the break in South Carolina not at all worried about the road environment That's a great pick, M squared, because I'm taking Ole Miss minus nine and a half at South Carolina for the game. Style points do matter for the Rebels. I mean, listen, they have the best offense in the country right now in yards per game, averaging 607. But here's some stats for you that are interesting. When Lane Kiffin's teams lose as a seven or more point favorite, they're 4-0 against the spread in the next game. And since 2019, Kiffin is 10-3-1 against the spread as a road favorite. We don't know about the health of of South Carolina's quarterback, uh, Sellers, and their running back, Rocket Sanders. Old Miss wins and wins big 34 to 17. All right, Emery, we're coming back to you. We know you went to school in Louisiana. I, I was expecting a-, a UL Lafayette, an LSU, a Tulane pick, and you come up with who? Yeah, listen, you got to give some shout out to UL Monroe uh, out there for what they've done this, se- this season. And listen, this is JMU's. I'm guessing this is their first trip to Louisiana. As soon as you cross state lines, you're going to hear a pocket way by the meters and whether you're playing in the bayou south of the southern part of the state the tall piney woods of the central part or even the hilly fog dense waterways and cutways of northeast louisiana ul moreau is outstanding this year and they have a chance to go to a bowl game they have an nfl prospect at corner to keep an eye on carlin vigors 62 190 outstanding ball hawk and ball skills this is going to be a test for jmu they won't beat the doors off the Warhawks, who've done a fantastic job so far this season. They're off to a 4-1 uh, start, into a 3-1 and start. So now you look at this team, got some confidence, got some momentum. Their new head coach is, is believing and saying the right things. I think this will be a lot closer than people believe. This will be the first test for you uh, for JMU. So take ULM plus 16.5 against the Dukes here. All right, Chip, uh, last week I got lucky in this segment, very lucky. I had uh, Oklahoma over Auburn, and it didn't look like that was going to happen, barring a dramatic fourth-quarter comeback. Now, you're going to play an Auburn game, but in a different way this week. Yeah, I'm going to take a lot of notes from the way that Auburn tried to sort of slow the game down against Oklahoma. It's clearly going to be something that Hugh Freeze has on his mind just to avoid getting absolutely blown out. And I'm sorry, Emory talked about the meters. We go, 
Da, da, da. All right, so we've got a situation where Georgia, like, are you going to have like a letdown or a hangover? I, I I don't know, but that Georgia first half under train was the only part of the treasure map parlay that didn't cash. I think we get back to this because Georgia is going to be in a spot where defensively they're going to have such an advantage over Auburn. And if Auburn is slowing it down, trying to limit the possessions, I do think that Kirby Smart and Mike Bobo don't want to put Carson Beck in any kind of position to make a mistake, maybe get him rattled so i think it's a conservative approach from georgia in the first half auburn tries to slow the game down and limit possessions and i'm still thinking about the meters in my head but mostly georgia auburn first half under 27 and a half m squared you talked about this one earlier in the show but you love it so much to include it as one of your best bets Back to Tennessee in the first quarter. It's a road game. It's a night game. It's in Fayetteville. Yeah, I don't care. Uh, I don't think Arkansas is going to touchdown in the first quarter. It, I think it's a field goal at best. I think if they're able to move the ball in Tennessee, which they will throughout the game, that Tennessee defense is going to hold in the red zone. We're talking about a field goal for Arkansas. Meanwhile, Tennessee, 18 points a game in the first quarter. Certainly not expecting 18 here, but definitely think that Josh Heupel is the best in the business out of the locker room, particularly in the these kind of matchups where it's a quality opponent, but not an elite opponent. I think that they've got the answers on both sides. So give me Tennessee here, minus three and a half in the first quarter, just an incredibly friendly line. I honestly, I was expecting this number to be minus six and a half, but the fact that you can get home with a win in a seven to three game, which would be a low scoring first quarter for Tennessee. I love this price point here, minus three and a half. So some will say that I'm a company man with this choice, and I just want to say that I just want to win games here. I'm going Hawaii, San Diego State, under 50 and a half. This game is on CBS Sports Network Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Wait a second, 50 and a half? What am I missing here? These two teams stink on offense. San Diego State's lost three straight to FBS teams, scored a combined 31 points. Hawaii 0-2 against FBS teams, averaging a whopping 13 points per game. Hawaii has the best defense in the Mountain West, giving up only 306 yards per game. That's not a great sign for San Diego State. I mean, I, I don't know who's going to win this game. I'm going to roll with San Diego State because they're at home. But this one is going to be ugly. I mean, in a good way, because we're going to make money off of it. Roll with uh, Hawaii loses 20-17 uh, to 17 to San Diego State. All right, let's recap it here. Emory going Indiana minus 13.5. Louisiana Monroe plus 16.5. Chip going USC minus 8.5. And, and the under 27.5 in Georgia, Auburn in the first half. Mike is going Ole Miss minus 4.5 in the first half. And Tennessee first quarter minus 3.5. And, and I'm going Ole Miss minus 9.5 for the game. And the Hawaii San Diego State under 50.5. Now, which week six favorites are on upset alert? And can Emory Hunt pick his fifth upset winner? It's absolutely unbelievable. We'll find out who coming up next. Welcome back to the Early Edge. It's time for Dog of the Weeks. Emery, look at this. Look at this. Unbelievable. I mean, this is, in, this is incredible. Colorado plus 450. How the heck did you come up with that one? I would have never given it a chance at the bounce house at UCF, and yet it was a like a 21-point blowout or even more. So, Emery, you are absolutely crushing it in this segment. You've already hit, I believe, four out of five, and you're up 10 units in the first five. Now, I was close last week. I lost by a point. I was going for my third straight win. I'm still up a little over two units uh, this year, giving out two winners. But Western Kentucky, inexcusable to blow a 20 to 7 fourth quarter lead. All right, Emery, you are absolutely killing it in this segment. Where are you going to start us off with this week? Come on now, EC. You know, close only counts in horseshoes and grenades. You either win or you lose. So, because I won last week with Colorado, um, I'm going to go with another small. Underdog. I couldn't find a big one to really make a splash. I wasn't bold enough to take you up and wrote a knockoff James Madison. I'm not that crazy, but I will look at this SMU game versus Louisville. And since they settled in on Jennings at quarterback, it has balanced out their offense. It has made their defense a little bit more rested. So therefore, they can now attack and get off the field. And they're low key better along the line of scrimmage than Louisville is, in my opinion. And why Louisville was able to make it a game a little bit against Notre Dame. If Notre Dame could throw the football like I know 
Jennings can, and I know this SMU football team can, they would have blown the doors off Louisville. I'm not saying they'll blow the doors off the Cardinal, but SMU will win this ball game because now they start to look like the SMU team that we saw earlier in the year or expected in the preseason. Now, and funny how that BYU loss doesn't look so crazy now, does it? Maybe BYU is better than we thought. SMU is definitely better than we thought we saw versus Nevada and BYU. So I like them to go ahead and upset Louisville. You know, when we're looking for our dog, sometimes just like folks, like I, I look at it a little bit like a money line sprinkle, right? You're looking for a high variance outcome, the opportunity to get great profit uh, out of something that could break one way or the other. And we've heard some great words on here about Ole Miss and the way they're going to play in the first half and even Ole Miss and the way they're going to get revenge. But there's something that happened against Kentucky that stood up out to me. And it was their offensive line for Ole Miss getting whipped up front. Because what Kentucky has that Ole Miss has not faced yet to this point is a defensive front with some real dudes on it, with some real athletes. And, oh, yeah, South Carolina's got those. Oh, yeah, they got them big time. Whether you're talking about Dylan Stewart, whether you're talking about Kennard, you're talking about players that can cause all kinds of problems, limit what Ole Miss is doing in the run game. Now, I think Kentucky's a little bit better in the secondary than what we're going to see from South Carolina. That's going to mean Trey Harris is still going to have some advantages. But... Guys, you flipped the calendar. It's Cocktober. This is the time when South Carolina thrives. This is the time when the upsets happen in Columbia. So, yeah, let's take a little uh, money line sprinkle on South Carolina to finish what they were not able to finish against LSU and pull off the outright upset. I'm looking at Syracuse and UNLV here. Look, this is a fantastic matchup, two of these teams here. UNLV, I loved them last week. I think we all did collectively on this show, and I think they might have got an upgrade at quarterback, but had they not blown them out, talking about their last game, if they hadn't had a blowout win over Fresno State, this line would be much closer than 6.5 or 7 and plus 200. This is indoors at Allegiant Stadium. It's a very fast track. Both of these teams can throw punches offensively back and forth. I think Kyle McCord will have success offensively. It's just a matter of can the Syracuse defense get a stop in this game or not. But for me, it's an ultra high variance atmosphere. I think we're going to see a lot of points on both sides. Could be whoever makes that turnover, whoever gets the ball last wins this game. I think Syracuse and UNLV are very, very evenly matched overall. So I will take Syracuse plus 200. And M squared, I'm going with an ACC team as well, and it's so weird to say that. Stanford plus 260 against Virginia Tech. How are the Hokies going to bounce back after really that awful ending in Miami last week where they probably got the wrong end of the deal, is the nicest way to say it. Stanford has one of the best rush defenses in the country, only giving up 76 yards per game, but the 10th worst passing defense. Good thing Kyron Drones from Virginia Tech has only thrown for 200 or more yards once in five games. Virginia Tech has given up a bunch of yards on the ground, 178 yards rushing. Micah Ford, Stanford running back, gave up, uh, had over 100 yards at Clemson last week. I know that Stanford is going to have a quarterback issues with Ashton Daniels, who might be out, but he's not a great passer anyways. Justin Lampson may step in. I'm going Stanford, plus 260 against Virginia Tech. Let's sprinkle. All right, guys, uh, real quick, uh, let's recap it here. Chip is on South Carolina over Ole Miss, plus 270. Emory, SMU, plus 195. Mike Syracuse plus 200 at UNLV. I'm going Stanford plus 260 against Virginia Tech. All right, guys, it has been another fun show. Great insight and picks for Chip Patterson, Emory Hunt, and Mike McClure. I am Eric Cohen. Thanks for watching the Early Wedge College Football Pick Show. And as I always like to say, let's hit it big. Good luck.